Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Joe Torrey. I'm one of the investment counselors here at Real Wealth Network. And today we're going to have our annual investor horror stories, in keeping with the Halloween theme. Uh, some things that can go wrong with investing and how you can avoid uh, uh, making these mistakes yourself. Today we're going to focus on short-term rentals, vacation rentals like uh, Airbnb, VRBO, those kind of properties. Uh, that's a little bit different than what we usually offer, but uh, those are becoming increasingly popular. So we want to give our investors a heads up about what that's like and what kind of pitfalls to be aware of. I'm uh, joined today by my colleague, the eminent Ben Eric Smith. Can you hear me, Ben? I can hear you, Joe. All right, great. So uh, we'll have uh, a few housekeeping uh, items. Glad to be here. Thanks, thanks everybody for tuning in. All right, our standard disclaimer, the strategies mentioned in the presentation today may not be appropriate for everyone. Other options not mentioned may be more suitable for your specific circumstances. Consult your personal accountant, tax advisor, and or attorneys to discuss your specific situation. So yeah, we're talking about short-term rentals today and it may sound great, but that doesn't mean that some other investment that we're not covering today might not be even better for you. So keep that in mind. And as always, past performance is no guarantee of future results. Real estate purchases are subject to investment risk, including the possible loss of amounts invested. And while we make every effort to maintain accurate and current information, the possibility of errors and or updates always exists. So real estate investing involves risk and watching a one hour webinar isn't going to remove your risk. So just, just uh, learn what you can today and ask your investment counselor and other advisors uh, for uh, further information. Here's our agenda. First, we'll talk about our, the presenters, and then we'll give a quick background on vacation rentals since this is a little different from the usual long-term rental properties that we uh, offer. And then we'll go into the horror stories. There are six horror stories we're going to cover today. Since this is a new asset class for real wealth, we don't have uh, a whole lot of uh, horror stories ourselves. Only one of the six horror stories involve a real wealth network member. Uh, the other five uh, were gleaned from research. And uh, after we, uh, of the six horror stories, three are avoidable, if you know what to look out for, and the other three are unavoidable but manageable, uh, and if you have a plan B. So we'll go over those, and then we'll just wrap up in summary, and then go through a Q and A, if we have time. All right. So um, just about the presenters. As I said, my name is Joe Torrey. I've been a, a real wealth investment counselor since 2016. I've been investing since 2004, back when I was buying in Phoenix and Dallas and those places. And I own mostly single family homes, long term buy and hold in Alabama and Florida. And All Ben, right. why don't you talk about yourself? I will do that. So a lot, lot, lot of you kind of know me, but I'm doing this for a long time. Been, been with Real Wealth Network since 2014. Been investing in real estate for a long time, you know, while holding various day jobs in various other industries. Um, Mainly buy and hold, but I did fix and flips for a couple of years, 2011 and 2012 in Arizona. And um, now I've got uh, 18 doors in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, and my one loan property in Arizona is a short-term vacation rental. So I'll, I've got some experience with, with that property, which I'll, which I'll pepper throughout today. But um, mainly, mainly buy and hold but some fix and flip. I, I still can't stop myself from doing fix and flips every once in a while. Addicting. Okay, so uh, let's uh, do a quick background on vacation rentals, just so everybody's level set and knows what we're talking about. So Wikipedia defines it as a vacation rental is the renting out of a furnished apartment, house, or professionally managed resort condominium on a temporary basis to tourists as an alternative to a hotel. So this is very different from our usual model where you sign annual leases and, and the tenants move in and they basically own the property and have exclusive use of it. Uh, these are also known as short-term rentals or STRs. And uh, in this webinar, we'll just be using those terms interchangeably. If we say STR or short-term rental, vacation rental, uh, it all means the same thing. So there's a couple, there's a, a lot of similarities to long-term rentals, but there are a few things that are different that you should be aware of. Uh, the one thing is that uh, you're not in the real estate business, you're in the hospitality business. So you're not a landlord, you're a host. Uh, you don't have tenants, you have guests. So it's a different uh, mindset. So if you're thinking in terms of tenants and landlords and all that, uh, 
it's not going to work it's a different different kind of business mm -hmm. and then appraisals and financing uh, I get questions all the time like do they appraise these properties like a house based on comps in the neighborhood or do they are they appraised based on net operating income the way you would appraise a commercial property and almost always it's a, it's a, appraised as a house uh, because when you appraise it as a house, the lender has a more conservative valuation. The lender doesn't know if uh, this is going to work as a short-term rental. You may have plans to buy it and rent it out, but who knows if that's going to work. So they use the more conservative uh, appraisal. And also for lending, for getting a loan, you're going to have to qualify for the loan the same way you would qualify for any house. They're going to ask for your FICO score, your tax returns, uh, your bank statements, your debt to income ratio, W-2, all that. So uh, it's not going to be, they're not going to look to the property's cash flow to pay off the loan. They're going to be looking to you to pay off the loan. In some instances, if you can't qualify on your own, the bank might consider the rental income from the short-term rental to help you qualify. But almost always, it's uh, based on your uh, credit worthiness. So Ben, why don't you take us through this uh, pro forma, how it's the sure. same and how it's different from a regular pro forma. All right, so so those of you in the uh, the real wealth stratosphere have been looking at our pro formas for years and, and it it's, it's just kind of goes over all the basic stuff, uh, which you need to know to intelligently evaluate whether you should buy that home as a, as a long-term annual rental or not. Um, if you're looking at something as a short-term rental, there's a bunch of other stuff that that we wouldn't normally include. So I'm just going to kind of go over those things. Using the example here, I know the, the font's a little small, but this is a South Lake Tahoe place, 3 to 1,600 square foot. But as an STR, we've got the purchase price, down payment, and closing costs, just like normal at the top. All used to seeing that. But, oh, my God, what is this furnishings thing? Furnishing line item, um, $35,000 um, for $1,600 worth of and a lot of times people forget, it's like, okay, it's not just a bed and a couch or two, it's a bed, a couch or two or three, um, a coffee maker, coffee filters, um, Wi-Fi internet, uh, silverware, uh, doilies, placemats, a pool table, a foosball table. I mean, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that goes into furnishings because remember, you're you're a host and you're renting out to guests, so you want to make the, your place as attractive as possible. So, and you also don't want to cheap out either because you're competing against all kinds of other people. So that number can be pretty hefty, but there's the 35,000 right at the top. Then moving on down, the monthly rent, 6,600, and you know that rent is calculated daily. If you look over in the lower left corner of this, um, it's got the monthly rent, and, and we're, we're calculating at an 80% occupancy rate. We'll get into that later, but, you don't want to just pick a number out of the air. You want to look at what the average occupancy is for your area. So for this one, Lake Tahoe, 80%. So $275 a night times 24 nights a month, 24 being 80% of 30 equals 6,600. So that's how that's calculated. So the, the monthly rent is 6,600. Then you've got your standard P and I and T taxes and I insurance. Um, property management, that's another one. It's a lot higher because remember, they're not just putting a tenant in there that's going to stay for a year or hopefully three or four years uh, where they occasionally have to deal with. No, they're running a small hotel. They're checking people in, checking people out, overseeing the cleaning, making sure the cleaning crew happens, sending somebody behind the cleaning crew to make sure that they, they did what they need to do from a quality control standpoint. So the, the property management percentage there is no eight to 10. It's more like 20 to 30, depending on who you find and what they do. Um, again, I can get into that later, but when I had my one in, in Arizona, I kind of narrowed it down to two different companies and I had to dive into this relatively foreign world. Um, one charged 30, one charged 20. I'm like, uh, what's the difference? Well, there, there were a couple big differences. Uh, the one that charged 20, I, as the owner, had to find and pay for the house cleaning separately. So it's just a different model. You really have to kind of look at it. And by the time I added that in, it practically was up to up to 30. I ended up negotiating down to 22, which uh, you're able to do. So anyway, property management, 20%. Utilities, a lot higher. You know, uh, annual rental, tenant pays for the utilities. And maybe there's some exceptions. If it's a multifamily, maybe you pay for the water. Maybe you pay for the common area maintenance, 
but it doesn't approach uh, paying for everything. For the short-term rental, you're, you, the electricity is in your name, the, the gas of the house has it's in your name, of course, the water, the homeowners, well, sorry, that doesn't count, HOA is different, but also Wi-Fi service, there's other things that you have to pay for. So that utility is gonna be a lot higher as a short-term rental. Um, so your monthly expenses are a lot higher, but your income is also a lot higher. So the hopes are that that more than makes up for it. You've got a lot more money coming in, your costs are a lot higher, but you hope that the money coming in more than makes up that gap for obvious reasons, because there's more wear and tear on the property, you've got furniture that's depreciating, all these other expenses. So there you have it. That's the difference between our traditional pro forma and this one, uh, a, a lot more little orange arrows there of things that are different. And then the very bottom, first year return on investment, obviously that's taking the first year return and, and dividing it into what your out-of-pocket costs are. And, and that's a crucial number to look at when evaluating these relative to anything else. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, one other thing about the furnishings, uh, generally you can't finance them. The bank isn't going right. to give you a 30-year loan for some temporary you know, furnishings and bedding and stuff right. like that. That has to come out of pocket. So uh, yeah. uh, that, that's an added burden. And uh, Ben, uh, you, you, I believe yeah. you've got some kind of windfall on that number. Didn't you? Well, yeah, and I'm, thank you for bringing that up because I was going to bring that up and forgot. But essentially, the house that I was looking at in Arizona, I mean, I narrowed it down to like 30 different places and flew out there a few different times. And I know Phoenix pretty well and Scottsdale. So, but I had a, a real good realtor that, that analyzed things for me and, and whatnot. And the, the house I ended up buying had a leg up on about most of the others in that it was already a short-term rental. Like the people that had owned it, you know, they were, they'd moved on to, to big McMansions with like 12 bedrooms that rent for 500 a night. And, and this is like a, a five bedroom that rents for a lot less than that. And it, it, it doesn't have a, a water park with a lazy river out back. So they, they kind of moved up the food chain a little bit, but it really helped me because I was able to evaluate actual revenue, not just hypothesis of what an STR in that zip code or that area code makes. Um, but the windfall Joe's referring to is, I bought all the contents for $1. So I bought the house for the amount of money that I paid for the house and then just said, hey, we'll, we'll buy all the furnishings for a dollar. And they went for it. I, I think they were kind of expecting, that. I mean, they weren't expecting that, that they would sell that separately, but they can't roll it in. It would have to be a separate bill of sale and then no one's going to finance it. So, gee, there's an extra 35000 using this pro forma. So a lot of times, if it's already been an SDR, they don't, they're not going to strip the house and, of all the furniture and put it in storage. They, they want it to stay with the house. So it's, it's a nice benefit if you can just get that. Well, that's a great tip for our viewers. If you're going to buy one of these to get one that's already been an SDR. Right. All righty, next. Okay, all right. Well, now let's get it. Now that everyone has an idea of what uh, we're talking about here, sounds mm -hmm. great, right? What, what what could possibly go wrong? So let's go into some horror stories. And all righty. I'll take the first one. Horror story number one, inaccurate, dun, 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 pro forma projections. What happened? Well, this, this poor hapless investor bought a single, I mean, a uh, short-term rental and found the rent projections were vastly overstated. The property barely broke even some months. You okay. gotta anticipate. Yeah, there we go. There's that delay <laughs> strategy. So what are we gonna do about it, right? Sanity check the rent assumption. So there's, there's a bunch of different ways to do that. I mean, un unfortunately, in, in the world that we live in, uh, you know, you can't take at face value the performance that the seller is telling you. Um, I mean, they, they might be very accurate, but I mean, there's other factors. I mean, when I bought my property, I mean, it was it was July of 2020. You know, COVID had just hit three months earlier. So it's like, they're like, well, you know, here's what we did in 2018, 2019, but 2019, we pretty much, you know, that's a good year, but 2020, uh, you know, we pretty much had to shut down for the first quarter. So those numbers kind of went out the window. Um, and then on top of that, just let's just take COVID out of the equation. They're gonna they're gonna be rosy. I mean, you know, I mean, we're taking their face value that their Excel spreadsheet they provide is is accurate. I don't think that they're falsifying numbers, but what exactly are they including in that? You know, uh, you, you just don't know. 
So a good way of sanity checking the rent assumptions that they are making for you, or if it wasn't a previous STR that you're having to make based on averages for the area, look for similar properties that, that specialize in short-term rental sites and see if rents are realistic. Like we've got a bunch listed there, Airbnb, VBRO, AirDNA, um, and then data.rabu.com, which Joe, you explained to me is an aggregator. So they're taking all the different data from those other sites that are mentioned there and just kind of collating them together like, like some travel sites do, um, just kind of giving you an average. And this one is from the example on the performer from the previous slide where we had $6,600 as an 80% decent rental assertion for the month. And, and uh, this data Rabu thing is saying 68.12. So it's like, hey, great, you know, there, there's actually a little bit above. So that tells me at least, and Joe weigh in, tells me that, hey, 6,600 is pr pretty realistic because they're saying 68.12. Correct, you get a good sanity check by looking at sites like that. Yep, so, and then also sensitivity analysis. Now, it's not because we're trying to be sensitive and, you know, politically correct. It's like, no, we wanna know how wrong could we be? How, how, how far off the rails could we go with this thing? So let, let's let's think, okay, let's just say, let's just imagine that I'm really wrong. How wrong can I be about the daily rate and occupancy and still break even? So I'm using an 80% occupancy and monthly expenses and whatnot. And, and let's just see, I know what my PITI are. You know, I'm pretty accurate with that because I've ran it through a mortgage calculator. I've gone into the tax website and, and gotten a good assertion of what the tax rate is going to be is as accurate as that as you, you can get with that. So I pretty much know what my costs are going to be. So how low can I go before I start getting in the red? And so that gives me an idea of, of how much headroom I have between my my realistic expectations and my worst case scenario. Um, and that's just a sensitivity analysis. Plug in what you think are realistic assumptions and see if the investment still makes sense based on a a scorched earth worst case scenario idea. Great, thanks a lot for that. All right, let's go on to horror story number two, which is related to uh, revenue and that's uh, seasonality. So the investor purchased based on the annual projections, but it found out that the revenue fluctuated wildly from month to month and for many months of the year, he had negative cash flow. So uh, this is a serious problem. Uh, if you have a long-term renter mindset, like we, we always buy houses and sign annual leases, you don't really think about this because if you're, if you're getting 2,000 a month in rent, it's the same every month. And so this isn't even something that most of us consider. But if you're gonna go into take that mindset into this space, you can get blindsided. So uh, on that same site, Data, Data Rabu, uh, Right under the 6812 that we saw on the previous slide, there's a link which you can't read. It says uh, seasonality. So you click on that and it shows you the 6812 may be the average per month per uh, over the year, but you can see there's huge swings from one month to the other. Uh, this is a, a resort, uh, uh, a ski resort in Lake Tahoe. So in the winter months when their ski season is on, the rents are very high, and in the summer, it's very popular too for hikers and backpackers. So you can see from the highest month, which I think is July, to the lowest month, May, there's almost like a 3x difference in uh, how much rent you have coming in. So when you look at something like this, you realize that at least four months of the year, you're gonna be cash flow negative. So uh, that, that introduces a risk and a potential horror story. Now, ways to manage that, one is to look at this chart and see what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> Um, if you are going to buy in a seasonal market like this, try not to close on the property right before the off season. So you don't want to close in say March and then have a couple months of negative cash flow. If you can try to close right before the busy season, so you have the cash flow coming in. Of course, the seller wants to do the opposite. They want to hold on to it until the busy season's over and then sell it uh, right before the slow season. So you'll just have to negotiate that with the seller. Uh, the second thing is to manage your cash flow. Uh, when times are good, like July and August or in the ski season, uh, save up your money, hoard your cash because you're going to have to hold yourself over during the, the lean times and manage your cash flow very carefully. But ultimately, what you can do is just not invest in a market that's this seasonal. Um, 
There are a lot of markets like uh, in Arizona or Florida that are year round. Every, every market's going to have some kind of fluctuation month to month, but nothing as dramatic as this. So uh, you introduce a lot of risk when you go into a market that has this much seasonality. So you have to think twice about whether that's what you really want to do or if you can find a, another market that's, um, that's more even. Some markets like Columbus, Ohio are dead for like six months of the year. Uh, Columbus, Ohio is where uh, the Ohio State is. And so during football season, all the alums from all over the country go into Columbus to, for football season. But after football season, uh, not that many people go to Columbus. So you might have five or six months of uh, negative cash flow. So seasonality is something you have to have on your radar and hopefully you can avoid making this mistake. Yep. All right. And, and just a quick note on that, I mean, my Arizona place, it, it June, July, and August, yeah, the, the revenue, it's still there, but it is about one third of what it, or like one fifth of what it is in, in March, April, May. You know, it's just, it's just a, a real flip flop. Um, it just, it still rents, it's just at a lower rate. Okay, so in horror story number three, property management. Uh, the, the hapless investor in this example bought a great property, but the property manager was mediocre. He was the he or she was the pinnacle of mediocrity. The property got low ratings on Airbnb.com and therefore low occupancy. And the review says, I would look elsewhere. The place is all original from the 1970s, including the bed sheets. Ooh, the amenities are extremely old. Pictures inaccurate. One of the towels was stained. Everything is old. Basically, uh, and here's the kiss of, kiss of death. The hosts are unresponsive. This place is pretty nasty, and the pictures are photoshopped. So don't go in expecting much. I mean. That review is is pretty much the the death knell. It would take a bunch of other reviews to to anticipate over. Yeah, and there's no reason for it. You know, that's those are all avoidable problems. Mm -hmm. So strategies: don't buy the property first, then look for the PM. Find the best PM first, then look for a property where they manage. And you know, a, a key is property manager that manages annual rentals and the property manager that manages SDRs are, it's, it's like oil and water. It's a completely different business model. And I, I would just, I would be leery of anybody who just casually announces that they do both. Although I'm sure they exist and I don't mean to denigrate those who do do both, but just know it's a completely different business model. One is you're, you're just waiting, hoping the phone doesn't ring and making sure that the, the rent comes in on time and dealing with any, you know, maintenance issues as they come up. Um, and 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 late payments or whatever, but the other one you're running a hotel. It's and I already talked about it earlier, so I don't want to beat be the dead horse. Um, ask the selling broker for recommendations. A lot of times they'll they'll know people um, and go to again uh, short-term rental sites, find properties with high ratings, and see if you can uh, surreptitiously find out who manages them if it's not listed listed right there. Great. All right. The the first three. Uh, horror stories we talked about are things that you can pretty much avoid if you buy the right property um, and get the right property manager. But now the next three are things that you really can't do anything about. So uh, there's a little more risk here, uh, but you can manage the risk and have a plan B. So this one was actually a Real Wealth Network member, a uh, client of mine. He owned a uh, short-term rental in Bear Valley, California, which was a, a ski resort, and he's doing very well. But word got out that the short-term rentals are a great investment. So these private equity funds from New York entered the market and started buying up properties. And they put too many short-term rentals on the market. And with too much competition, that caused daily rates and occupancy rates to plummet. And the investor is now in the process of selling the property. So uh, when something good happens, everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon. And then that drives... Um, uh, results down, uh, returns right. down. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of stupid money out there. Uh, some people just have money and they just invest in, uh, and it doesn't make sense. Right. So what do you do with something like this? All right, there's a couple of strategies. One is what I call the first mover advantage. Imagine if you bought into this market a couple of years ago and prices were low enough that the property makes sense. And then years later, uh, prices have gone up and most of these areas appreciate a lot because they're very desirable areas near beaches near ski resorts so when the price has gone up anybody who's trying to enter the market is going to have a huge hurdle because now the property is too expensive and the cash flow is not as good so that's kind of a barrier to entry if you get in first before it becomes well known and, and popular 
the second advantage being in first is that you can establish a track record. You know, if you have a couple of years worth of track record, five-star reviews on Airbnb and VRBO, and then any Johnny come lately who tries to enter the market is going to try to compete with you on that, that's going to be harder for them to do because you have a track record. So there is an advantage to getting into a market quickly and uh, getting yourself established. Another strategy is to pick the right property with the right amenities. When when you go to Data Rabu or Airbnb or any of those sites, look for the in a given area. There's some properties that are going to rent for much more every night than others. Uh, sometimes it's just they have five bedrooms instead of three, but a lot of times it's because they have some kind of amenities. It could be a pool, it could be a hot tub, maybe really nice views. So you find what are the amenities that guests are willing to pay a premium for and that can help guide you in terms of which property to uh, to buy so if you have one of those that has those amenities then it's going to be harder for others to compete with you uh, another strategy is to pick markets with virtually unlimited demand um, st augustine florida gets something like eight million visitors every year and so it's it's not even scratching the surface the number of airbnbs there is is, is just a drop in a bucket. So when you have that much demand, then there's more room for more competitors. And finally, as a last resort, if the property is appreciated, as it was with this investor, you can just get out. I told him to sell to the private equity firm. I mean, they're looking to buy properties. He's got an established prop, uh, track record and it's got all the furniture in it. Just sell it to them and get out and then put your money somewhere else. So there are a number of things you can do to uh, mitigate the risk of competition but also to get out of the market if uh, it gets really bad mm -hmm. amen all right horror story number five a recession um okay so what happened property performed well until the covid pandemic and people lost jobs in the area discretionary spending is the first thing people cut back on you know it's like okay uh we need to put food on the table before we casually go gallivanting off to saint augustine for a week so we're gonna we're gonna cut back on that um so that's the first thing they cut back on so what are you going to do about it well pick the right property with the right amenities like joe talked about a minute ago um figure out what what amenities are in the greatest demand i mean like for example the house that i have in arizona it had a it had a, a pool and it had a jacuzzi that in that area at least is pretty much the bare minimum you, you know you, you got to have at least those two things because everybody else does now ironically I take that back. The house that backs up to my house is uh, is same model, built in the 50s, whatever, um, same neighborhood, but they don't have a pool. So I'm I don't actually know, but I'm imagining that they they probably rent for 30 to 50 dollars less a night than than my house does, just because of that. So properties with the most sought after amenities going to be the last to lose bookings. And it says here market to relatively recession proof guests. So People that aren't caught up in the daily permutations of the market, like retirees, don't need jobs so much. They're on a fixed income or they just, they've got bank, they've got coin in the bank nearby, so they don't have to worry about it quite so much. High net worth individuals obviously aren't affected, affected and some foreign guests aren't affected. So, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to know how to, or how to market to. A friend of mine has a, a short-term rental Actually, he turns his house into a short-term rental, and he's much more of a do-it-yourselfer. Like he he lists on Airbnb and he checks guests in and checks guests out. And he's even done it when he was like halfway across the country in Idaho. I, I'm not willing to take on that as of yet. I, I I'm too busy doing other things. So I use a, a third-party PM that handles all of that, and they seem to be doing a pretty good job. But I, I don't really have control over who they're marketing to because it's 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 just who they're marketing to it's who clicks on uh, and and most of them they have their site but then they're also sending it out to the airbnbs and the vbros so you, you know i i don't make any special effort to market to a particular group but if i was my friend who did maybe i would go hey coachella's coming to town that weekend maybe my house is in palm Springs, so let me advertise in a different way um, you know, but you know that takes time. Yep. And uh, your property manager uh, would be a great help here. When times are bad, what do they do? How do they find uh, guests? So uh, talking to them about what their their plan is in this scenario would would help. Right. Yeah. Absolutely.
Yep. Okay. Last horror story, government regulation. So what happened or what could happen? So an investor bought this short-term rental and was doing well with it, but then suddenly the local city council passed an ordinance to ban or restrict vacation rentals due to pressure from the hotel industry. And if you look at the uh, municipalities that have put restrictions on short-term rentals, there are places like Las Vegas, Orlando, San Francisco, uh, New Orleans, Honolulu. Uh, what do these places have in common? Uh, lots of tourism industry and a very powerful hotel lobby. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's it's not about uh, being a business friendly state or not. Florida's business friendly, you know, but but uh, uh, Las Vegas is is a business friendly area. But uh, uh, it's about the hotel lobby. So and, and again, this is something you can't really control. And if you you bought the property and it's doing well, and then suddenly something like this happens, that really uh, uh, messes up your business model. So here are a couple of strategies. One, as we mentioned earlier, invest in markets with large demand. St. Augustine, as I said, gets 8 million visitors a year, and the the few short-term rentals that there are in that area are not a threat to the hotel industry, at least not yet. So uh, that would be one thing to do. In fact, um, Vacasa, which is one of the large uh, property management companies for vacation rentals, they rated St. Augustine number two in the country as a place to buy a, a vacation rental. Right. Uh, another option, if push comes to shove, is sell the property. You know, if uh, it's no longer working for you, uh, presumably if you've owned it for a couple of years, it, it's gone up in value because it's in a desirable area. So you could still sell at a profit and redeploy your capital somewhere else. Yeah. And, and, and oh, I've, I've got something to add, Joe. But sure. um, so uh, the funny thing is that that yeah, you have no control over these governmental regulations. Now a lot of times. It, you'll be grandfathered in. So they'll come in with some regulation and they'll say, well, you're already a long-standing or, or an existing short-term rental. We're just putting these regulations in for new people. We're not gonna issue any more STR licenses or whatever that particular municipality does. Um, so you're grandfathered in. Um, another friend of mine went to, flew out to Arizona, the recurring theme, Arizona, to look at short-term rentals and they hooked up with a, a realtor and the, the very first house they took them to, I think was in Scottsdale. And there were all these signs up around the neighborhood, you know, like political signs planted in the front yard. Don't turn our neighborhood into another, you know, STR. You know, there was, there's just this anti STR campaign going on in that particular local little jurisdiction. And that, that scared him off. It's like, uh, maybe this is why this particular person is selling because the, the, the tide is turning. Now, they probably would have been grandfathered in, but I mean, if already it's it's obvious that there's an anti-STR sentiment um, and your neighbors are gonna you know not like you, uh, do you really care? You don't live there, but yeah, you know, you'd soon not like, I don't know, there, there is something to be said about moving into an area where 50, 70% of the houses are not owned by people who live there you know i i when i moved to florida and sorry joe i'm going off on a tangent i don't mean to take over but fine back in 2016 when i left california moved to florida um i first was looking at Ana maria island which is um, about two hour well about an hour and a half west and north of where i ended up in sarasota and after you know we'd done a vacation rental there and liked it and you know did the typical hey let's we like it here let's move here you know um and then i just i realized that gee two out of three homes are short-term vacation rentals so would you really want to move there move your family there where you're you're kind of living in this like zombie neighborhood where everyone's transient except for you know joe down the street lives there and Sally Sue up the road, but everybody else is just, it's a different face every single weekend. And it's, it's kind of, kind of odd. So I think that it, the anti SDR sentiment in some areas are that people are seeing their neighborhoods kind of slowly morph into these transient things. And that's where you, you get this anti, anti sentiment. Now I have no idea if that thing in Arizona passed, what happened? I think evidently the vote was happening like that very day or that week. That's why you know, it was just bad timing. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something to look out for. You might be grandfathered in, but um, if, if the sentiment is, is kind of turning against you, you know, I don't know. Maybe not. 
Okay. Yeah. I was wondering how long it was going to take you to say Sally Sue. So <laughs> I uh, uh, admire your restraint. 37 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and a uh, final thing you can do is see if you can convert the property to a long-term rental with the annual leases. In some cases, the numbers might still work if you want to hold on to it. If the market's still going up, you might want to hold on to it for as long as you can and then sell as late as possible so you can pocket as much capital gain as possible. And, and also, hey, adversity breeds opportunity, right? I mean, maybe it'd be good to buy in that neighborhood because those signs going up scared half the people out. You're, you're one of the few people standing afterwards. The signs go away. The, the uproar dies down and now the competition is less and you end up doing better. Right. Okay, so we went over a lot today. So let's uh, just summarize the six horror stories. The first three again are avoidable. One is uh, rent projections that are too aggressive. So you can protect yourself by doing a sanity check by going to the various short-term rental sites and seeing if it's realistic, if, w if what they're claiming is realistic. Also, you should do a sensitivity analysis. If it's going to break even or make money at 24 days a month, suppose it's only 20 days a month. Am I still in the positive? Suppose it's only 200 a, a night in rent uh, instead of 275. How how wrong can I be and still have uh, a good investment? And then uh, if you think the investments, the uh, projections are too aggressive, then plug in what you think are good, reasonable projections and then uh, see if the numbers still make sense. As far as seasonality goes, uh, you can analyze seasonality for the markets you're considering on that website uh, we showed you. Um, you might want to avoid markets with huge swings month to month. If you are going to buy in a seasonal market, uh, you should manage your cash flow carefully and try not to close on the property right before the off season. Two months isn't too bad to go without with negative cash flow, but if you have to go four or five months without with negative cash flow, that can that can become real risky. And uh, property management, uh, identify the best property manager in your area, talk to them about what really makes a property rent quickly, and what's in most demand, and then use that information, that intelligence to buy the property. Don't buy the property first and then look around for a uh, property manager as an afterthought. And then the last three, uh, if you have too many competitors, uh, hopefully you moved in quickly and got in first and you have some advantage, you have a track record and you got in when the prices were more reasonable and your uh, vacation rental is more profitable. Um, offer the most sought after locations and amenities so you can uh, beat the competition that way. They won't be able to compete with you. Uh, during lean times, recessions, uh, the properties with the best amenities, the best features are the last ones to lose business, so that'll help you. And also you could talk to your property manager about shifting your marketing campaign to target recession-proof guests. And finally, government regulations. Uh, there are, if the government, the local government starts putting the restrictions on short-term rentals, you can invest in markets with large demand. So there's still a lot of demand and less likelihood of government regulations. You can convert the property to a long-term rental, or if you have to, you can uh, you can sell. By the way, on the government regulations, they're not always just a ban. Sometimes it's just a restriction. Like you can rent a room in your house, but you can't rent the whole house, something like that. So uh, just don't don't flee. Just uh, look at what what's really going on and and how much it's really going to impact your business. Yeah. Okay. I guess I got to click here. All right. So. Uh, Let's just wrap it up. We covered a lot of information today, so we're trying something new. Uh, you can download an article called The Ultimate Guide to Vacation Rentals. So uh, you go to realwealth.com, buying vacation rental property ultimate guide. Uh, you go to that link and you can download, I think it's about eight or 10 pages, but it goes into uh, a lot of the themes we talked about today. Uh, since we ran through it kind of quickly, you can uh, take more time and uh, go over it if you're seriously considering a short-term rental. Or my marketing department tells me you can use this QR code to read it. So somebody uh, try that and see if it works and let us know. Talk to your investment counselor. Yeah. All right. Uh, what do we have next? Uh, well, we could we could go over some Q&A. Um, I, I, I just want to ad lib on a couple things real quick. Um, okay. You know, one of the, one of the things that 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 is crucial that you look at is just the patchwork of laws and whatnot in terms of, you know, you mentioned it earlier, like some places, like like 
I'll take St. Petersburg, Florida, for example. The city of St. Petersburg um, has this anti-STR mentality, um, but they kind of look the other way. They don't really enforce it. So you're not supposed to technically have anything under, I don't know what it is, 30 days or whatever, but they don't really care. But the problem is you don't want to buy some house and put $60,000 furnishing it and get it all perfect because you're kind of at the whim of if somebody complains, then the city is forced to do something about it. So if, if you're in, in Pinellas County, which is the county that St. Petersburg is in, there's all these other little cities and other little pockets of unincorporated areas right adjacent to St. Petersburg that do not have uh, any such moratoriums. So I know that, that our, our, um, our property team in that area looks for unincorporated areas because they know that you, know, you, you don't have to worry about that. Like where I live in Sarasota, there's this 30-day 30 day minimum in the city of, but in the uh, the county of Sarasota, you don't have such a thing. So that's another thing to look at. And then there is this other really nice kind of out. It's almost like, okay, over here, you've got the annual rentals, you know, people rent for 12 months at a time. And then over here, you've got your short-term rentals. Well, there is a, a middle ground. And that would be like, there's this company called Furnish Finder, where you rent your furnished home for 30, 60, 90, maybe 180 days to like a medical professional, some you know nurse or orthopedic surgeon or whatever that's being transferred from another area and is going to live in wherever for, for a short term, meaning short term, meaning not four nights, but meaning 30, 60, 90, 180 days. So they may, you might not make as much money as if it were an Airbnb but you're making a lot more than if it was an annual rental because it's a furnished rental and you're getting a premium for that, that medical professional that needs a place for three or six months. So there are outfits like that. So another option is for one of those horror stories, oh my God, the government stepped in, I can't do it as a short-term rental anymore. Well, they could keep it as a furnished rental and go through like furnished finder or some of these outfits. So that's another, another really good attractive option. All right, great. All right, we have some questions. Oh, Gunther says that the QR code works. That's great. Yeah, good deal. Uh, the pro forma that was shown just shows cash on cash return. Yes, that's correct. There's also appreciation. There's depreciation write-offs. There's a lot of other benefits to owning real estate. We were just looking at the cash on cash return on that one. Yep. All, All right, right, let me let me take a question here. Is there a way to research what amenities people actually search for? Um, and Diana says, as a frequent guest of short-term rentals, I would gladly pay less for a nice, clean property that didn't have extra amenities I don't plan to use. Um, I, I don't know if there's a way to search that. I think I would call the property manager because I'm doing my due diligence and talking to various PMs. And I would say, hey, you know, in you know, zip code 85424, is it really necessary that I have a hot tub? I mean, do you, are you renting any places that don't have hot tubs? And how much of a premium? Because that thing's going to cost me $8,000 or so to put in, not to mention the utility costs and everything else. Is it really necessary? And then, you know, you can tell if they're just pulling the answer out of the air or if they actually know. So I, that's how I would research what amenities are worthwhile. All right, great. Here's a question for you. How much time does this take? Do you have to spend a lot of time on a short-term rental? Um, I really do not. You know, the biggest issue that I've had is um, you know, I've had some, that friend I mentioned earlier that does their own, they, they have discovered that they're much better off. They just say, Hey, it's a seven day minimum. That's the way it is. You check in on Saturday and you check out on Friday or whatever it is. I think it's like in, in on, in on Saturday and out on Friday. Um, and that's just the way it is now with, with, when I went with that company that, that manages mine, they didn't have any minimum at all. And I was noticing to my horror that like every Friday, Saturday, Sunday was booked. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it would sit vacant. So it's like these people would come in and book the weekends and maroon the week. And it's just, no one's going to book. Most people aren't going to book Monday through Thursday. They, they want to combine it. So I'm like, no, forget this. This isn't working because, you know, you add up the entire month and it's, it's only rented for 12 nights, you know, uh, three times four is 12 and then four, to, you know, the other 20 nights are sitting vacant. It's, it's not acceptable. So I upped it to four day minimum. And then I think I upped it to a five day minimum and I'm just kind of cautiously edging towards the seven day 
because I'm, I'm afraid to do seven day because I'm afraid that's going to scare enough people away to where it's not worth doing. So that's taken the most time and it's not a whole lot of time. Um, but no, the, the management company does everything else. The only time I have to get involved is, you know, they called me and said, hey, your leather couch is looking pretty sad. You need to replace that. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, so I'm going to have to fly out to Phoenix and go to a couple furniture stores because I'm not going to order a leather couch online and, just, and then they go there and discover it's really uncomfortable. But no, it doesn't take me a whole lot of time. Okay. Oh, and what about the other uh, short-term rentals in your area that you're competing with? Do they have five-day minimums and seven-day minimums? You know, I'm I'm being a hypocrite. I have not looked into it. Uh, when when I when I have gone to STR to like Airbnb or Vacasa or whatever, um, I, you know, you enter a date range, and I assume that if I entered a five-day date range, it would just obviously eliminate anybody that has a seven-day minimum. And I haven't taken the time to really look into and research that. I'm just kind of like experimenting on my own. And my my experiment of gone to four and then going to five it has not adversely affected rentals. So I'll probably just go to seven and see what happens. And you could always try it, just test it. Exactly, yep. All right, Jack uh -huh. would like to know, where can you find ratings for short-term rental markets in the USA? Uh, I know of one, uh, Vacasa, the uh, property mm -hmm. management company I mentioned earlier. It's V-A-C-A-S-A. -A -A. You just uh, Google Top Vacation Rental Markets 2021 Vacasa, and I think there's about a dozen of them, or 10 or 15. Uh, St. Augustine was the second, I remember that, but uh, I don't know what the other ones were. Yep, and actually Colin uh, has a question that's apropos to what we were just talking about. He says, for short-term rentals, have you found a management company that can do nightly rentals during peak season and then shift to monthly for slow months? Well, I actually do use Vacasa, and it, all I have to do is go into my little online portal and change the minimum rate. I mean, not the rate, but the, the minimum amount of nights. Um, I might have to call them and have them do it, but I'm pretty sure I can do it myself. So if I were wanted to do that, I could just, you know, d do exactly what you're talking about and adjust it on a seasonal basis. Okay. Would vacation rentals be good for a first time investor? Okay, wait a second. Could you repeat that, Joe? I wasn't listening. I was reading another oh. question. <laughs> Would uh, vacation rentals be good for a first-time investor? Um, I don't think so. I think I'd, I think it would be better to dip your toe in the rental market by getting a, a vanilla annual rental um, where you don't have as much much cost up front, you don't have as much ongoing utility costs, and then slowly advance to a short-term rental. But I mean, that's not an absolute. Some people are more adventurous. So they're like, oh, I really like it. I mean, the best thing in my mind about an annual rental is, is it, it's more of a lifestyle choice, right? I mean, the annual rentals that I have in, you know, Ohio or Pennsylvania or, you know, Jacksonville, they're unfurnished. They're, and even if they were furnished, I'm not gonna go staying there. I mean, I, I'm just not. I mean, there's, there's no desire for me to stay for any reason for a week in you know Cincinnati Ohio sorry Ohio people I just wouldn't so I'm like okay I've got a number of annual rentals so now why don't I shift over why don't I start buying the occasional property that's in an area that I would actually like to stay at so that I don't have to spend two hundred dollars a night at some crappy best western somewhere I can stay at my own property and it only requires me to think in advance before somebody else books it um, so, I mean, I think if you're like, you know what, I only have so much money to go around, I would like to invest. So I have, you know, maybe one short-term rental in Phoenix, one short-term rental in Tahoe, and one short-term rental in, I don't know, Bend, Oregon, so I can go skiing. So I will, I will buy three of those that are three times more money than nine annual rentals in places I will never stay in, so that I don't have to spend money on crappy hotels you know, and resent the fact that they're $200 a night because I'm staying there in peak ski season. So it, it's it's kind of a good idea from a lifestyle standpoint if that's where your head is at. Um, but if, if, if that's not a factor, then I would think annual rentals is, is a better way to dip your toe into the water as a newbie investor. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, 
if you think about it, the uh, short-term rentals, vacation rentals, they're very expensive. They're in de desirable areas like ski resorts and beaches, so you might have to spend a million dollars for something like that. Mm -hmm. So if you're a first-time investor and you have a, a million dollars worth of property you could buy, you could buy one of these short-term rentals or you could buy four houses in two different markets somewhere and get some diversification. And it seems to me that's a better way to start your basic bread and butter, single family home, annual lease. And then after you have a couple deals under your belt, if you're feeling adventurous, you can uh, get into the short term rental space. But to just buy one outright, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. And uh, first first time rental, I, I think that's a, that's a, a, risk, a risky uh, approach. Unless you know from day one that you always wanted to be in the hospitality business, I think you'd be better off just buying a regular house. And, you know, and, and I have to say, I, I absolutely understand the analogy of the hospitality business, but you know, as as somebody who actually did toil in that industry for a while for, on the audiovisual side of it and dealt with hospitality, I do not want to go into that business, and I don't want to run a hotel. But luckily, I've got a property manager that does all that. So you know, I'm not really, I'm not really. I'm, now I am in the business in the sense that economically I'm affected by it, but I'm not having to deal with the day-to-day -day checking in guests. Um, you know, okay, wait, I'll let just follow up on that. Uh, the question was about, uh, is this a good investment for a first-time term, first -time, uh, uh, investor? So reversing the question, who would this be a good uh, investment for? Uh, uh, in addition to an experienced investor who already has a portfolio going, it's also very good for a 1031 investor. Uh, if you're doing a 1031 exchange, especially in this current environment where it's hard to get inventory, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to find one uh, short-term rental somewhere than to try to find four regular houses uh, in different parts of the country uh, within 45 days, your identification period. So if you're a seasoned investor and you're doing a 1031 exchange that's fairly large, then that uh, vacation rental might be something you should consider. Right. Good point. Glad you brought that up. Um, Sorry, Maggie course. mentions any talk of adding local bed tax fees, et cetera, to performance. No, there's no talk of doing that because it's completely different everywhere, but that's something you absolutely need to look into. You know, does, does uh, I mean, like one thing I found out with Arizona is there's just some little annual thing you have to apply for. A, I don't know what they called it, you know, some combination letter number thing. And it, was, it wasn't it was huge, but it's just another $150 a year I have to renew. And, and some locations are adding bed tax and and, and actually, um, Rory writes, I'm just going to go ahead and read your entire question here, Rory, because it's, it's a good one to bring up. The national news has been reporting the difficulty that employers are now having filling lower wage jobs, such as in restaurants and other hospitality. Are you aware of issues that short-term rental property managers are having getting homes cleaned quickly between guests? I personally have not heard of that. Um, it, you know, knock on wood. It hasn't hasn't come up. It wouldn't surprise me if you know they're having trouble finding people. But I I have not heard of that. That doesn't mean it's not the case. But that's that's definitely something to to consider. Is but I mean you know the same would go for you know your annual rental and finding somebody to to be a handyman on staff. I mean it's it's just like a a universal labor shortage everywhere um, for whatever reason. Um, Joe, I'm going to take one more Rory question. Okay. okay. Is that all right? Sure. Okay. Short-term rentals also have big income tax differences as compared to long-term rentals. LTRs, annual rentals as we're calling them, are treated as passive income by the IRS, but short-term rentals are considered a business with active income. So no tax benefits from passive activity loss carryovers due to depreciation expenses with short-term rentals. PALs are great. In other words, passive activity losses are great for long-term rentals. So, you know, that's getting a little bit in the weeds in terms of tax issues, but there's definitely some things to consider, like it's considered active versus passive and, and, and all that goes with that. Okay. Yeah, talk to your tax advisor, like we said at the beginning on the uh, disclaimer slide. Yep. Make sure you know what you're getting into and what the uh, implications are. Uh, what happens if there's damage to the property or theft? Somebody steals your uh, your toaster. Does the tenant does the uh, guest pay for that? Um, you know that that comes down to how on top of it they are. And for some reason, I just think that if a guest stole a toaster, I wonder <laughs> if anybody would notice. You know, you probably get a complaint three guests down the road. The one who really likes bagels in the morning 
why doesn't this place have a toaster? And then it would filter up the chain on mail. Wait a second, there was a toaster there when I bought the place. You know, so I just have a feeling that you'd be out a toaster. However, um, one thing that, that uh, and I have to be careful here because I don't know exactly, but there is something that every every guest night, I pay some like $2.13 insurance fee um, that I get, I get charged for that Vacasa charges me as a pass-through thing. And I think that that's what that covers. It like covers your deductible for little things like that so that you're not, you know, obviously contacting your insurance company with your 5,000 or 2,500 deductible for little stupid stuff like that. Um, but um, there are things that cover it. But at the end of the day, if somebody wants to take my toaster, go ahead. They're $15 or 20 or $30. If you're so desperate that you need to steal a toaster, have at it. Enjoy your bagel. <laughs> but uh, do uh, guests pay a security deposit like a tenant would uh, in case yeah. there's damage? They do damage to the yep. property? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, have you ever booked an Airbnb and there's all these things up front you got to pay um, and, then, and then you get it back after they determine that you didn't burn the place down or trash the place? Okay. Yeah. All right. Diana would like to know, is there a way to research what amenities people actually search for? I mean, that's that's one that earlier I was kind of mentioning, like I would just ask the property manager. I mean, I, who knows? There may very well be, but I mean, you know, they make 1,700 different flavors of ice cream because everybody likes different things. So I, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I would say yeah. talk to the property management company about what, what's uh, hot in that area, what uh, people search for. And also, like I said earlier, go onto the sites and you see two houses that are very much the same, but the one with the pool goes for $50 a night more. You can get a sense of what people are willing to pay extra for. You know, exactly. And, and Colin mentions the whole, is it more difficult to get a loan if you're buying a house up front and it's gonna be a short term? Um, I didn't have any difficulty getting the loan, and you'd mentioned that earlier that 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 they're they're gonna, you know, they're just gonna they're you're getting it as a personal, you know, you're, it's an investment property, so they're gonna look at your DTI, your FICO score, your track record, um, and your your information. I don't think it's an issue. You know, where I found that it was an issue was with insurance. So I, I initially thought it was going to be an annual rental. And when I mentioned, oh, it's going to be a short term, they're like, okay, you better get this special insurance policy because, you know, you don't want the insurance company disallowing a claim because the, you didn't have this special right or this special policy. And it, it cost me a little bit more, uh, which is to be expected because there's different people floating in and out of there. So the insurance is going to cost a little bit more. But I don't think there was an issue with lending. All right. All right. We're coming up on the hour. So let's wrap this up. One last question from Amy. Uh, she said a rule of thumb was to budget $10,000 per bedroom for furnishings. Is that about right? Yeah, I think that's a, that's way too high, frankly. I mean, the most expensive, most just like just like with building a house, the most expensive rooms are the bathrooms and the kitchens. And the same thing with furnishings. Th those are by far, especially the kitchen, all the appliances and everything else. So bedrooms are comparatively cheap, right? $10,000. But I guess maybe they're saying, taking it all into consideration. If you've got a four bedroom house, budget 40,000. A six bedroom house, house 60,000. Because, uh, you know, it, since I paid for my stuff with a dollar, I don't really <laughs> know. Um, I was looking at a, a place along about five years ago and we would have had to furnish it. We ended up not doing it. This was in uh, on Anna Maria Island. Um, and I remember the uh, they said it was going to be about thirty or forty thousand dollars to furnish it, and it was a three bedroom house. But again, you know, how are you doing this? Uh, you know, I know that that one of our teams that we work with in Florida, they they offer the service of they they will do it for you. You can also go out and find uh, vacation rental people that charge an arm and a leg because you know they're designers and they're really making your house super nice and they're making a markup on it, right? So you could also go to Ikea and do it for a lot less. So I, I don't know, 10,000 a bedroom seems a little on the high side to me. Yeah, okay. Well, 
you could always talk to the property management company because this is not an area where you want to skimp because you want to have nice amenities that attract people. So yeah. what, what I, wouldn't rec I would not recommend the IKEA method. Plus, <laughs> you know, all that stuff comes in little flat boxes and takes six hours per chair to install and all these special tools. Are you are you there? Do you have how much time do you have? Right. <laughs> you know. OK, well, I think we'll wrap it up. We're on the hour. Um, we went through the questions. Our little buddy there had a question. So thank you for watching. I hope uh, you uh, found this worthwhile. Short-term rentals is a new offering that Real Wealth has been doing for the last year or two. And it's uh, an option that you should consider, especially if you're doing a 1031 or if you're having trouble finding conventional uh, inventory uh, in this market. So it's just one more option for you to invest in. Yeah, All right. I, I think um, it's a fantastic arrow in the quiver of any real estate investor is, is that have a bunch of annuals and then just have the occasional short term investment gives you another place to stay. You don't have to pay money for hotels, assuming you want to stay there. And, and even if not, it's just it's just a different it's like a stock portfolio. You don't put all your stuff in high tech. You, you've got, you know, some some value stocks and I mean, it's just spreading the wealth around in, in different classes. I think it's a good idea. All right. All right. With that, we'll uh, conclude uh, today's webinar. Hope you found it worth, uh, worthwhile and uh, we'll see you uh, next week. Thanks for attending. Bye. Bye-bye. See you, Joe. Bye, everybody. Bye.